Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to get this webinar started. I see that we still have some people that are joining now, but we'll be able to get them all up to speed in just a few minutes. So thank you very much for joining us at this webinar today. Today for the KISS Metrics webinar, we're going to talk about Hooked, how to build a habit-forming product. I'm really excited about this webinar because I've had the opportunity to use this in the real world. So our speaker today, Mir, is going to be able to tell us a lot more about how his book can show you how to build habit-forming products. To start out, if you do have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to Nir or myself on Twitter. You'll notice that we do have Nir's Twitter handle on the screen, and as well as you can reach out to us with the hashtag of either KISSmetrics or you can use the hashtag KISSwebinar. Now, to get started, I'd like to introduce you to Nir. Nir wrote the book Hooked, which I've personally used. My name is Dan Maga. I am the Director of Marketing here at KISSmetrics. But Mir, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? And if you folks can let us know in the chat if you can hear us and as well as see the screen, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Jen. Great. So, yeah, my name is Nir. Um, I have been studying uh, habit forming products for the past two and a half years, and I'll walk you through some of the techniques that I've picked up on the common patterns of habit forming technology. So why don't we uh, get kicked off here? Everything sound okay? All right. So yeah, um, if there's if there's one thing we've off. learned over the past several years, and I'm sure many of you have uh, seen this in your own life, is the amazing power that products have to change our behaviors. And so what I've done uh, is to look at these companies and figure out how some of these companies seem to go from toys from these nice-to-haves to touching hundreds of millions of users and making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. And when I give that description, I'm sure some of, some of you have some companies in mind. I'm talking about the companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and these companies that seem to kind of come out of nowhere and with, with a span of about a few short years, they're somehow touching hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people's lives and these products are interacted with multiple times per day. So how do they do that? And, and are there any common patterns to these companies that we see so profoundly changing people's habits? And so that's been the, the, the subject of my study over the past few years. Uh, it's really been around the subject of habits. And just so we're all on the same page around what a habit is, a habit is very simply defined as a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. It's about 50% of the things that we do day in and day out that affect our day-to-day -day behavior. Um, and these habits, I believe, for the first time, can really be used and leveraged through technology to help people live happier, healthier, uh, more connected lives. And so that's really what I'm interested in helping you do today, is to learn the basics of how habits are formed so that you can use them for good, so you can help people live better. Now, it turns out that in my, my research, I saw this common pattern emerge time and time again inside habit-forming technologies, which was what I call the hook. Now, the hook, very simply, is an experience designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. That's really what, what we see time and time again in these experiences, are, uh, is this pattern that we see emerge of connecting a user's problem to, the, to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And we find that in these products, time and time again, these four steps of a hook are repeated in every experience that becomes a habit. Now, those four steps are a trigger, an action, a reward, and an investment. And of course, here, the cycle continues through these four steps of the hook model. So let's get started by explaining this basic framework by diving into the first phase of the hook model, the trigger phase. Now, when it comes to new behaviors and new habits, there's a very important lesson that we have to remember when we're designing habit-forming products, and that is that we can't just will habits out of thin air. We can't just create an awesome technology and expect our users to just start interacting with it and immediately form these long-term habits. That's just not how behavior works. That it turns out that habits are not created, they're not formed out of thin air, they're built upon. And the metaphor I like to use here is that of a pearl. 
that it turns out that the way a pearl is formed inside an oyster is layer upon layer upon layer. So that if you were to cut a cross section of a pearl, you would see that it has rings, kind of like the rings of a tree. And so this is a great metaphor for how we form new habits, is that our behaviors are formed one layer on top of another. There's always some kind of foundation for new habits to emerge. So if you think about the fact that you know, we learn our ABCs so that we can decode words, and these words make sentences, and sentences allow us to enjoy novels. And so that's why this is a very good metaphor for how we form these new behaviors, one layer on top of another. Now, these foundations with which we build these new habits are triggers. Triggers are things that cue action, right? They prompt the next response, and they come in two types, two flavors, if you will. We have external triggers, and we have internal triggers. Now, external triggers, you'll be very familiar with, right? We in the, in the design community, technologists, they understand what external triggers are about. External triggers are things that tell the user what to do, where the information is in the trigger itself, are in the trigger itself. So, things like a billboard, a call to action, a buy now, tweet this, an alarm, an authority figure, a cop telling you where to go when they're directing traffic, all of these things are examples of external triggers. So, so we in the design community, builders, entrepreneurs, technologists, we know all about external triggers. They cue a, our next action by giving us the information in the trigger itself. But what far too many people don't know enough about, I believe, are the internal triggers. Now, internal triggers are things where the information for what to do next is informed through an association in the user's mind. And not like an external trigger where the information is in the trigger. An internal trigger it, it cues the next action. It turns out just as reliably as those external triggers, but the information for what to do next is stored through an association in the user's mind. So what we do when we are in certain places, when we're around certain people, certain routines or situations, and most often in response to certain emotions, cues our next action. It determines what we do next and, of course, what technology we use. And not just any emotion. I'm referring to a specific type of emotion that it turns out that negative emotions are powerful internal triggers. So what we do when we feel lonely or tense or confused or discouraged or bored or lost or fearful or fatigued or powerless, what we do when we feel these negative emotions dictates what we do next. It's associations with these feelings that dictate what technologies we use habitually. Some of the research that we know this is the case comes out of a study that was done a few years ago that found that people with clinical depression check email more. Now, why would that be? Why would people with depression check email more? You know, I gave a corporate workshop a few weeks ago and somebody stood up in the back of the room and said, it's because email makes us depressed. Well, actually, that's not really the, what this research found, although sometimes I do feel like my inbox uh, brings me down. But actually, what this study did find was that people who suffer from clinical depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states. They feel down more frequently than the rest of the population. And so they could literally be identified by how often they use the web, how often they check email. Think about this for your own life or perhaps other people's lives. What, what technology do people use when they feel lonely? Well, many people use Facebook. And how about when we're unsure, when we experience a sensation of being uncertain? What do we use? Before we actually scan our brains and ask ourselves if we know the answer, we, of course, Google it. And how about when we're feeling bored? You know, two to four o'clock in the afternoon when you have a big project that you need to work on, but uh, you don't really want to work on it at that moment. So that's a great time to hop onto YouTube or check the news or stock prices or sports scores, lots and lots of solutions to cater to this pain point of boredom. So what do we do with this? How do we as entrepreneurs, as designers, as professionals, what do we do with this information about the fact that internal triggers cue habitual action? Well, it turns out that we really need to understand 
what our customers' internal triggers are. It's very difficult to scratch the user's itch, if you will, if we don't understand what their problem really is. And not just on a surface level, not just what they're able to perhaps articulate, but on a deeper psychological basis, what are their internal triggers? What's their emotion that's cueing this next action? Let's take a look at a case study here of Instagram. I'm sure many of you use Instagram. What, made, what triggers made Instagram so habit-forming? Well, the first channel that Instagram used to, to grow its app was, of course, Facebook and Twitter. And by its users posting onto Facebook and Twitter, people found these uh, these external triggers, right? The, the external trigger of here's my photo, check it out on Instagram as posted on Twitter or Facebook was a great external trigger. The information for what to do next was in the trigger itself. Click on to Instagram to see more. Then of course you install the app, you've got the app icon, that's an external trigger. And then you start getting notifications that tell you to check out your friend's photos. That is also an example of external triggers. But what about the internal triggers? Well, Instagram also caters to this internal trigger of solving the pain of losing a moment in time. So when I see a beautiful sunset or something exciting happening with, with my friends or my pet or my kids, these are moments in time that I want to capture and that Instagram as well as many other photos, photo uh, technologies provide is this ability to solve this pain of this fear that the moment is gone right? That fear of losing the moment. This is very reminiscent of the Kodak moments you know, 20, 30 years ago, where Kodak spent billions of dollars in about 100 years training people to see this moment in time. And that's the moment. Every time you feel this fear of losing a moment, this product becomes the solution. There's an internal trigger that's cued, that cues the next action. But of course, you know, Kodak spent billions of dollars in about 100 years training people to see the Kodak moment. Instagram did it in about 16 months by having users teach other users what the Instagram moment is all about. But of course, Instagram did is much more than just a way to capture photos. It's also a social network. It, does, it did much more than just the native camera could do. So the more times people use the product, the more they began to associate it with other internal triggers. Whenever they felt bored or lonely, or FOMO, does everybody know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out? Well, fear of missing out doesn't feel good. When we feel that negative valence state, we form an association that the solution is Instagram. Now, Instagram did all kinds of things right, right? There's lots of that went into making that business successful, but one thing I think they did particularly well was to identify and go after this specific point in time where they are addressing the user's pain point, this fear of losing the moment. So that's the trigger phase. The next phase of the hook is the action phase. Now the action is the habit itself and it's defined as the simplest behavior that's done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. Now let me just show you for a moment how simple simple can be. So something as simple as a scroll on Pinterest or searching on Google or pushing the play button on YouTube. What could be simpler than these extremely easy to do actions in anticipation of reward? Now it turns out that there's actually a formula for predicting a user's likelihood to do a particular behavior. And this comes to us from the work of BJ Fogg, who's a researcher here at Stanford. And Fogg posits that for any behavior as represented by B, we need three things to occur. Three things have to be present at the same time for any behavior to occur. And this isn't just on the online context. This is offline, online, doesn't matter. Any human behavior requires motivation, as represented by M, ability, ability is how easy or difficult something is, and then, of course, a trigger. Now, a trigger is what we just talked about. So let's dive into these three elements. First, motivation. Motivation, as, de as defined by Edward D.C., the father of self-determination theory, is the energy for action, how much we want to do something. Now, psychologists have been arguing about the nature of motivation forever, but you know, Fogg gives us these six factors of, of motivation that are simple enough to be useful in a startup context, that to get people to motivated to do an action, Fogg posits, that it relies upon using one or more of these six levers, that all human beings seek pleasure and avoid pain. We seek hope and avoid fear. We seek social acceptance 
and we avoid social rejection. And so every message, every adver piece of advertising that, that encourages uh, a user to do something by boosting motivation really can be boiled down to one of these six elements time and time again. So that's motivation. The next thing we have to have in order to create a user behavior is ability. Ability is the capacity to do a particular action, how much we want or how easy an action is to do. So here again, there are six factors that increase or decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring by making it uh, easier or harder to do. So how much time is required to do an action? How much money is involved? How much something costs? How much physical effort is required? How many brain cycles? Brain cycles is a big one when it comes to technology products because it turns out that the harder something is to understand, the less likely it is that the behavior will occur. Social deviance. So we are more likely to do a behavior when we see other people like us also doing it. And then finally, non-routine. Now, non-routine is why habits are so darn important because it turns out that our behaviors have a sort of repeater effect, that we become more likely to do something simply because we've done it before. It literally becomes easier to do because we've done it before. Now, what is this called? What's this principle? It's called practice. The more we do something, the easier it becomes and the more likely we are to do it in the future. So habits are incredibly important when it comes to designing these behaviors because it turns out that, the, that by encouraging these repeat engagements, it literally becomes more and more likely that people will do them in the future. So if we take these three factors that Fogg gives us of motivation, ability, and triggers, we can actually plot it on a graph that I like to use with my consulting clients when we talk about, hey, why isn't a certain behavior occurring? We can get around this common vocabulary around, let's, let's take a look here. We want the user to do a particular action. Do we have sufficient motivation? Do we have sufficient ability? That's the x-axis. So if something's very easy, it's far to the right. If something is very hard, it's far to the left. And if we have sufficient motivation, sufficient ability, we cross that blue threshold. And if a trigger is present, the behavior will occur. Okay? So we need sufficient motivation, sufficient ability. And if a trigger is present, the behavior will occur. So we can ask ourselves, if the action isn't happening, what's missing? Is motivation too low? Is the ability too hard? Right? Is the behavior too hard to do? And of course, is the trigger there? We have to have that trigger present for the behavior to occur. So let's take a look at how Twitter has evolved over the years using these three principles of motivation, ability, and triggers. Here's Twitter in 2009. Take a good look. Here's Twitter in 2010. And here's Twitter today. So what do you see? What's changed in these, in these three examples evolving here over the, over the last five years or so? Well, the first thing you might see is that there's a heck of a lot, of, a lot less text and less triggers than there was in 2009. I mean, take a look at 2009. What was a trigger and why was a trigger and how was a trigger and watch a video is a trigger and sign in and click here and click here and get started. <gasps> wow, there's a lot of triggers. All those triggers queuing action and you know what that does is increase cognitive load, right? And increase the brain cycles required for the user to understand what the heck should they do. And by the way, what did Twitter want users to do in all three cases? They wanted users to sign in or sign up. That was the intended behavior. So by making it as simple as possible as they've evolved to today, they help people do the action and it turns out that that was a much more effective strategy than trying to boost motivation. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Well back in 2009, people needed more explanation, right? Didn't they need to be talked to and need to be influenced when they came to the site? They didn't know what Twitter was about. Well it turns out that's not true. That in my research for the book and for the workshops that I teach, I found out that actually, you know, everybody came to Twitter with some kind of information. Nobody just by mistake typed in twitter.com even in 2009. So it turned out when, when Twitter took that momentum, took that motivation, and just made the action easier just to get into the product and start following people, that's when they saw uh, conversion increase. That's when they started habit formation, this habit formation process, by getting people to take the action as easily as possible. So the lesson here isn't build a web page that looks just like Twitter. That's not the, the, the real lesson. The lesson is to make the intended action 
as easy as possible by increasing the user's ability to take the intended behavior. Okay, so let me just pause for a second and see if there are any questions here. Are there any questions I can take, Dan? Hey, Nir. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Earlier, we had Adam ask, what internal trigger triggers are relevant for business-to-business -business products? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, I, in this presentation, in, the, for, in, in most of my book, I really focus on consumer web applications, but these same rules apply uh, across the board. Um, so, whether it's enterprise or consumer, it doesn't really matter. Now, there are certain types of products that, that don't require habits, so let's be very clear about that. Habit formation is not magic pixie dust that we can pour on every product and all of a sudden it's going to be successful. There are only some products that actually need habit formation. So if you think about the examples I gave earlier of Pinterest and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, these companies couldn't survive without habits. They require unprompted user engagement, right? They, they require us to take out our devices yeah, and just check. You for a second there. Are you still there? Oh, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Sorry, we lost you for just a couple seconds there. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I was just saying that, that product, some products require habits and some products do not require habits. So in an enterprise context, if, if your product is used repeatedly, if it requires unprompted user engagement, then you need habits. But if your product is something that is bought inside the enterprise and then is put in a closet in a server room somewhere and is not engaged with day to day, you may not even require habits in the first place. But if your product does require habits, there are still these internal triggers that you're going to have to figure out. You're going to have to figure out what, what emotions or what routines or what situations cue users to action. So for example, on a product like Salesforce or GitHub or Yammer, these are all enterprise products that all have strong internal triggers. So with a company like Salesforce, you know, for, for someone in the field uh, checking up on a client, there's, this, there's a few internal triggers. It might be the uncertainty of what am I supposed to be doing today? Right? What clients need, the, need follow-up right now? There's this uncertainty. There's this uh, pain point around what should I be doing right now? And so uh, every time a salesperson in the field might feel this emotion of who should I be talking to right now, Salesforce becomes the automatic solution. Right? So that could be one example. And there's, there's lots of others, of course. And that's where diving deep to understand your user really comes into play to understand those internal triggers. That's awesome. That's really, really good. And we got one more question from Derek. And Derek asked a really interesting question. Did Instagram solve the pain of losing the moment or did they create the pain of that you're going to lose the moment? Yeah. So, you know, I don't believe that you can create uh, the pain. And of course, that's not what we want to do. This isn't, you know, habit forming technology is not about creating pain. That's, that's kind of sadistic. What we want to do is to find the user's existing pain point. And, you know, nostalgia and the need to save the past is an innate trait in human beings, right? We all save trinkets, we all save memorabilia. Nostalgia is something that seems to be encoded in our DNA. And of course, that's, so that's an existing pain point that you know, Kodak served, that heck, the native camera served on, the, on these phones way before Instagram came along. Um, but Instagram figured out that internal trigger and catered to it. So the goal is not to, we don't create pain points, we don't create internal triggers, we attach to them. So maybe I'll keep going here in the, for the sake of time to the next phase and then I'll, I'll stop in uh, at least one more time here to get some more questions. Is that okay? Sounds great. Good job, man. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so the reward phase. So after the action comes the reward. The thing the user is, uh, came to the product to address. It's time to scratch their itch. Now when it comes to rewards, we need to start in the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Now the nucleus accumbens was first studied by two Canadian researchers by the name of Olds and Milner in the 1940s. And they found that this particular part of the brain did some very unusual things to the, the, the test subjects that they were experimenting with. Namely, they experimented with lab animals. And they found that when they implanted this tiny electrode inside the brain of lab mice, and they gave them this tiny electrical current that they could stimulate, so meaning the, the little, the little uh, lab rat could push on a lever and then feel this bit of stimulus into the nucleus accumbens. That's all they wanted to do. These mice became addicted to the sensation of stimulating the nucleus accumbens. And it turns out that in later experiments, similar studies were done with people, where they were given a little button, they could stimulate the nucleus accumbens, and that's all they wanted to do. Hundreds of hundreds of times they would keep clicking on this 
this device to stimulate this very special part of the brain. In fact, some of them had to have the machines forcibly removed to get them to stop clicking. So it turns out, however, that you don't have to have electrodes to stimulate this part of the brain. Other things also stimulate the nucleus accumbens. So things that we desire, like uh, expensive objects or certain chemicals, junk food, sex, and right there in the middle, technology, all activate this special part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Now, Olds and Milner and the, the majority of the psychology community thought that, well, what the nucleus accumbens is for is the pleasure response, right? It must stimulate pleasure. Why would people and lab animals do anything to, to, to get this sensation of stimulating the nucleus accumbens? Well, it turns out that we now know that that isn't actually the case, that the nucleus accumbens is not about stimulating pleasure. What it is about is stimulating the stress of desire. Because it turns out that the nucleus accumbens is activated when we anticipate a reward. As you can see from this study done at Stanford back in 2001, that area in, in yellow and red there is the nucleus accumbens becoming activated in anticipation of a reward. But interestingly enough, when we receive the thing we think is going to make us happy, the thing that we want, that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active and other areas of the brain become more active. So it turns out that the role of the nucleus accumbens is to stimulate us to act by creating this itch, this itch that we seek to scratch. That's the role of how the brain gets us to take these behaviors. And it turns out that there's actually a way to supercharge this stress of desire. Is anybody curious out there? Does anybody want to know what this, super, this way to supercharge the stress of desire, craving, and wanting is? That's exactly the point. The unknown is fascinating. So when I took that little bit of a pause and asked you a question, some of you might have perked up. What's this guy going to say next? And it turns out that variability, a bit of mystery, the unknown, causes us to increase focus, increase engagement, and it's highly habit-forming. And of course, the research that shows us this is the case came out, you might remember from your Psych 101 class back in college, you may remember the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. So Skinner took his pigeons, he put them in a box, and he gave them a little disc, and every time they pressed the disc, every time they you know, pecked at this disc, they would get a food pellet, a reward. And at first, this was done on a, on a, on a fixed schedule. So a pigeon would click the lever, and a food pellet would come out, and basically, the pigeon would eat whenever they were hungry. But then Skinner did something a little different. Skinner introduced a bit of variability, what he called an intermittent reward. So sometimes the pigeon would click on the disc, but nothing would come out. Other times the pigeon would click on the disc, and something would come out. And when he created this variability, the rate of response, the number of times he observed the behavior occurring, increased. Why? Because it turns out that the nucleus accumbens is stimulated by variability. Right? Variability is highly habit-forming. It's engaging. It causes us to increase focus. And we see time and time again in all sorts of products that create habits, that, that, har that, that to hold on to our attention and focus, they use the one or more of these three types of variable rewards. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. And so I hope after this webinar, maybe you'll start looking at the world a little bit differently, and you'll see in your own life what are the things that you find most engaging, most engrossing, and what are the variable rewards behind what, keep these, what keeps these experiences so enticing? So let's look at a few examples. The first variable reward type is the search for social rewards, what I call rewards of the tribe. Now, rewards of the tribe are things that have an element of variability, that feel good, and come from other people. So empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good, partnerships, cooperation, competition, all of these things feel good, have an element of variability, and come from other people. So of course, probably the best technology example is social media, where when Mark Zuckerberg got married, 1.3 million people liked it. And let's think about for a moment how variable a site like Facebook can be. What am I going to find in my newsfeed? How many people, or what, are, what do people post? How many people liked something? What are the comments going to be? All sorts of variability involved with social media. Okay. Another example that many of you might be familiar with is, of course, Stack Overflow. 
Stack Overflow is the world's largest technical question and answer site in the, in the world. It's 5,000 questions get answered every single day. Why? Right? This is technical documentation, stuff that many people, maybe most people, would think is really boring to do. And yet, thousands of people are doing this work for free. Well, let's think about this for a minute. What happens when you submit an answer on Stack Overflow? Your answer gets upvoted or downvoted. And those upvotes get turned into points, and these points become badges. But these badges aren't things that you display on your profile. It's not about you know, pimping out your profile and looking cool. It's about social validation. It's about the value that you've given to the tribe you care about, to the people whose opinions you respect, in this case, namely fellow engineers. And of course, there's a highly variable component to it. Right? How many people will, will like what I posted? Will there be anybody saying I was wrong? There's a high degree of variability associated with using a product like Stack Overflow. The next variable reward type is the search for resources, rewards of the hunt. The search for resources stems from our primal search for food and resources. And of course, in modern society, these things are bought with money. So when people think of variable rewards, they often think of slot machines. They think of casinos, where, of course, the variable reward is money, is the currency that comes out of these machines. Right? That's an example of variable rewards of the hunt. Now, what many people don't consider is that the same rewards of the hunt translate into information rewards. So if you think about the feed, why is it that this design pattern of the feed is so popular today? Why do so many products use the feed? Well, let's think about it on a product like Twitter. The first thing's not very interesting. The, first, the second thing isn't very interesting. The third thing's not very interesting. Oh, but they're the fourth thing. That's very interesting, right? And so if I want to get more rewards, what do I have to do? I just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Finally is the search for self-achievement, what I call rewards of the self. Now, rewards of the self are things that have an element of variability, that feel good, but don't come from other people and aren't about information or material rewards. So the search for mastery, consistency, competency, completion, these are things that are intrinsically motivating. So if you think about gameplay, right, when we're playing an online game or an app, a game on our phone, these are things that we can play by ourselves, but they're fun because of this search for mastery, consistency, control, competency. If you're familiar with self-determination, theory or uh, this is this is really about intrinsic rewards now if you think to yourself I'm not really into games that's not really my bag I bet you you play this game every day so your compulsion to check email and clear the unread messages or do the tasks on your to-do list or clear that jewel icon on an app just to get rid of it these are all examples of rewards of the self they're variable and they're about the search for consistency competency completion and control so now that you know about variable rewards, let me give you a, a bit of warning here. Variable rewards are not a free pass. We can't just put variable rewards into our product and expect it to succeed. And in fact, when people have tried to do that willy-nilly, it usually fails. And so there's been a lot of examples of gamification gone wrong. And to be clear, I'm not against gamification, but using gamification, these game-like elements in non-traditional gaming uh, environments, is, can be a good thing, can work, but where it goes wrong is when it doesn't scratch the user's itch, right? If you don't understand the user's internal trigger clearly, you have no way to understand if the variable reward is actually satisfying the user because that's the point of the variable reward is to scratch the user's itch and yet leaving them wanting more, right? Giving them some bit of mystery about what they might find the next time they use the product. That's what the variable reward phase is all about. Finally, the last step of the hook model is the investment phase. So just to review, the trigger phase was about understanding the user's internal trigger, what brings them to the product, what, what uh, internal trigger we're going to create an association with. We use the external triggers to prompt the next action by giving them a piece of information for what to do next. The action is the simplest behavior in anticipation of reward. The reward scratches the user's itch and yet leaves them wanting more. Now it's time for the investment phase. And this is the part of the hook that I think uh, is the most commonly overlooked when it comes to building habits. Because the investment phase is something the user does for a future benefit, not for immediate gratification. That's what the action phase is all about. The investment phase is about a future investment. It's a small bit of work the user does to increase the likelihood 
of their next pass through the hook. And that's done in two ways. There are two ways that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass. The first is by loading the next trigger, by loading the next trigger. So for example, when you use WhatsApp and you send someone a message, there's no immediate reward, is there? You don't get points, you don't get badges, nothing really happens when you send someone a message. But what you're doing is investing in the service, right? You're investing in that platform. By sending someone a message, you've loaded the next trigger because you'll probably get one of these. That's, that jewel icon on your phone is an example of an external trigger bringing you back into the hook. So the investment phase of the hook makes it more likely for you to pass through the cycle again by loading the next trigger. That's what the investment phase is about. Or on Pinterest, when I install the pin it button, right, when I put this little icon in the Chrome of my browser, now every time I'm browsing the web and I see something I want to save and I have this internal trigger of wanting to keep something I found and I fear losing it, there's my external trigger right there on the Chrome of my browser, right next to the old habit of bookmarking which is what Pinterest is in the business of replacing. The second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is this principle of storing value. You know, one of the reasons I love working in technology as opposed to working in the physical, uh, in making physical products, right, things made out of atoms, I like making things made out of bits. The reason I like the technology business so much is because when it comes to things in the physical world, your computer, your phones, your tables, chairs, everything that's around you right now, these things, the more they're used, the more they lose value, right? These things depreciate over time. But habit-forming technology should do the opposite. Habit-forming technology should get better with use. It should appreciate with use. And it does this through the principle of stored value. So the more music I add to iTunes, the more content I put into a product like iTunes, the better it becomes as my one and only music library. It gets more valuable the more I invest in it. On a, on a, a product like Mint.com or any other personal finance software, data, the more data I put into this product, the more valuable it becomes to me. The better it becomes as my personal finance uh, app. Right, the more data I add to it. Or on a site like Pinterest, for example, uh, or Facebook for that matter, if you were to log into my accounts, it actually wouldn't be that interesting to you because it's been customized with my data. The more data I put into it, the better the product becomes for me. Followers, the more followers you have in a site like Twitter, for example, the more valuable it becomes a way to reach your audience. So if Twitter was to send out an email tomorrow that says, hey, uh, we're gonna shut down Twitter unless you send us a check, Who's going to be more likely to pay? Someone who has 10 followers or 10,000 followers? Of course, it's going to be the person who has more followers because he's accrued value in the system the more followers he has, he or she has. Finally, reputation. So the higher my reputation score is on a site like TaskRabbit or eBay or Airbnb, I can literally take that value to the bank. Right? I can make more money selling my goods and services based on my reputation score. And how likely am I to leave for another platform, even if it's better, after I've invested all this uh, time and effort into building my reputation score? Pretty unlikely, right? It's a, it's a barrier to exit, to stop using the system. It, it, because I've invested in all this stored value, I become unlikely to leave. And so I become more likely to use the product in the future. So that's it in a nutshell, the hook model is an experience designed to connect your user's problem to your solution with enough frequency to form a habit and through successive cycles through the hook by passing through these four steps of a trigger an action a reward and an investment this is how users shape preferences and shape attitudes now that was a lot and I apologize if that was fast uh, and, and, and if you missed a few things, I don't blame you because normally I teach a course at Stanford Graduate School of Business and at the Design School, which spans several weeks. Uh, so that was about, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes or so? So that was a heck of a lot of information. So uh, if that was too much, don't fret. There is a, a book available called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, available on Amazon, and you can learn more at my blog as well, nearandfar.com. But to summarize the five fundamental steps of the Hook model, it's really about answering these five questions. If you're trying to determine, is your product potentially habit-forming, 
or how can you make it more habit forming? You need to answer what internal trigger is the product addressing? That's first and foremost. Then what external trigger gets the user to the product? Then in the action phase, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward? In the reward phase, it's about is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And then finally, in the investment phase, what's the bit of work that's done to increase the likelihood of the user passing through the hook in the future? Increases the likelihood of the next pass. So before I open it up for questions, I just want to touch on one very important topic, and that is the morality of manipulation. That, let's face it, designing habit-forming products is a form of manipulation. And one thing I didn't discuss uh, too much was addiction. And there's a fine line between habit formation and addiction creation. And I am not a, an advocate for addiction creation because addictions have a very specific definition. So I don't, I don't like people using the term addiction unless they, they really know what it means. And that is that addiction is always bad for the user. Right? Addictions are always harmful. Habits, however, can be good or bad. So we have a very special responsibility to, as, as designers, as developers, to make sure that we're creating healthy habits. Because let's face it, the technologies that we're building are the ones that users take with them to bed. These are the technologies that are the first thing that people reach for in the morning before they even say hello to their loved ones. And as Ian Bogo said, our technologies are becoming the cigarettes of this century. So I want you to use what you've learned today to help people live better and to assess your responsibility as an entrepreneur, as a designer, to think of ways that you can help people live better, healthier, happier, more connected lives by building healthy habits. You know, if there's one thing we have no shortage of in this world, it's problems to fix. And so I hope that we, you will use what you learned today to help people find meaning to engage them in something important, and to borrow from the words of Gandhi, build the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you very much. And with that... Thank before... you very much, Nir. That was really, really good. That Great. was awesome. Oh, continue on. You have a survey here? Yeah, just real quick before, before I take questions, or while I take questions, if you could, um, while you're uh, listening to the questions, if you could hop on over to www.opinion2.us, I'd love to know what you thought of the presentation. Uh, I'd love to see what you thought. And of course, as soon as you do that, you'll be taken to my SlideShare page where you can have all these slides for yourself. I know the presentation will be recorded as well. Uh, but I'd love to hear what you think. It's a very, very short five-question survey. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to open it up for questions. Awesome. Well, good job, Nir. That was really, really good. I learned a ton in that. So I definitely appreciate you doing this webinar. Uh, just so everybody knows, we have about 14 minutes left for this webinar. We will be ending it up. So I have a bunch of questions which I've started to take from some of the attendees. And for the folks who are still asking questions, we'll do our best to get to those. But if we don't get to your questions, don't forget, you can, of course, go to nearandfar.com, and you can reach out to Nir through there or reach out to any of us on Twitter. So you can see Nir Ayals uh, on the screen. You can, of course, reach out on Twitter, or you can reach out to any of us with the hashtag KISSWebinar. So to go back to a question that was asked earlier about business to business and forming habits and companies like that, one of the questions that was asked on top of that by Catherine was, how can you introduce a variable reward into an online business to business service where there's social privacy that you cannot be shared? So basically there's no social sharing that's allowed to happen, but how do you introduce a variable reward into a business to business product like that? Yeah, so um, the, the, I hope I didn't mean to um, uh, give the impression that you need to use all three variable reward types. That's actually very, very hard to do. Very few products can use tribe, hunt, and self uh, because in some contexts it just doesn't make sense. You know, as, as this example uh, that you just mentioned, it may not make sense to have a social variable reward in every product. Um, however, there, there are other variable reward types. So, for example, instead of using social reward, I, I mean, one thing I would do is to ask yourself, are you sure, right? <laughs> Maybe there actually is a way to encourage some kind of social rewards, uh, some kind, something that feels good that comes from other people. You, you may, you know, if you, if you ask yourself, how might we, there may be a way. If there really isn't a way, I think I would look at the other variable reward types. So rewards of the hunt, is there kind of a, uh, an information gathering mechanic that you might be able to use that's constantly changing, there's constantly some kind of update? 
or is there a reward of the self? Is there something that the user needs to do and that's constantly changing? There's kind of this control and competency mechanic of check here and see what the next thing to do is and, and keep going, right? There's kind of like a, a to-do list type mechanic or, or a messaging type mechanic that you might be able to deploy that has a bit of variability. So the answer here is that not every product needs all three. In fact, that's very hard to do, but the, you need at least one, right? You need at least one bit of, of some kind of variable reward uh, to create these, these hooks. Great answer, that was really, really good. Now, we have another question that came in from DNK, which is, we've, how uh, do you feel that not only does this work in products, but how can you form habits based upon content? More into how does the hook apply into making content more habit forming? So I, I, I'm not sure if you said what kind of content, but I'm, I'm, I'll just take the question as um, like online content. So blog posts and news articles and pictures and just in general online content. In, in, in that capacity, you know, if you think about it, um, content, if it's good, uh, has to be variable, right? The, the news hooks us because it's variable, right? Not necessarily, if you think about it, how much of what you listen to uh, on NPR or on uh, you know cable news or in the newspaper or online, how much of that is really does really affect your life versus how many how much of it is just novel and interesting and changing, right? News has to be new, and of course it, it, it it's enticing because it's variable. It's built into what makes these sites habit forming. Heck, the the good old reliable newspaper delivered to your doorstep uh, for those of you who, <laughs> who remember when that was done is really about this action of, of picking up the newspaper and seeing what's new today. That's a variable reward around information. So that's not that different from your, your Twitter news feed where to get more variable rewards you take this simple action of a scroll. Uh, and and where, you know, new, where content becomes uh, boring uh, and uninteresting is when it's you know, very predictable. That's really good. Another question that came in kind of based around not being a product, Aubrey asked, what about high price items, and not so much for the service or a cheap product, but rather doing it for a weekend conference? How do you make something like that habit forming? So to be clear, not every business needs habits. Uh, and so I, I talk about this a lot more in the book, but um, you, know, it, you need a very specific type of business to need habits in the first place. And frankly, um, I don't know if that's, you know, if you could, if you could have a, a blank canvas, uh, forming a habit forming, creating a habit forming business, may not necessarily be the, the, the best path for your company. So uh, if your business doesn't require unprompted user engagement, so if you can bring users back to your product through, uh, through ads, through search engine optimization, through, heck, a physical storefront, those things should be used, and they, they, those businesses don't require habits. Plenty of businesses make lots of money and help their customers live better lives without forming habits. It's only if your business model requires unprompted user engagement, time after time, for long periods of time, do you even need to go down this path of forming habits? And to be, you know, to be fair, it's not easy. I mean, how many products have created new habits in our day-to-day -day lives? You know, maybe a handful, maybe, you know, maybe two handfuls. Uh, there aren't that many companies that can so profoundly change people's day-to-day -day habits, but when, of course, they do, they, they do so on a very large scale. Those are the companies that are so iconic today. Awesome. We have a question in from Josh, which is, can you give us some examples of smaller businesses that have success, successfully introduced hooks? Smaller businesses that have introduced hooks. Well, for an example, uh, instead of just a Facebook, an Instagram, WhatsApp, maybe some smaller products. Like for an example, I can say a company named Fleetly, which I use for fitness. And I use the product every single day I go to the gym, which is roughly five times a week because they've got me into the habit of using the app to guide myself what I'm supposed to be working out or what I'm supposed to be doing at the gym. So are there other mm -hmm. products that you know of that are smaller, not everybody knows of, that have created habits and hooks to get people addicted to their product? Yeah, uh, what, just to clarify, not addicted, because addicted is a bad thing. <laughs> but very true, very true. Hab habituated, I like to say habituated, because that could be a healthy <laughs> habit. <laughs> but you know, you know, this same, I focus on technology products, um, so a lot of the, it may just be out of my, my um, industry expertise to look at, at, at other um, 
other industries because I, I focus so heavily on technology. But to be clear, you know, I, I use this hook, uh, these hooks in my own life to form offline habits as well. So uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to form a habit around uh, running. Uh, so I, I actually used hooks to encourage myself to, to go running. I didn't use an app. I just built my own hooks. Uh, and then, you know, in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the other side of that coin is that I also used the hooks to break bad habits. So, you know, I think a big part of why I do what I do uh, is because I believe the world is becoming a potentially more addictive place. And I'm borrowing the words of Paul Graham there that, that you know, I, I know very few people here in Silicon Valley that don't struggle with technology. And the fact that these products are so good that they are distracting, that they, they, they take our attention away from the other things that we want to do in life. And so I'm an advocate for looking at your own life and assessing, hey, now that I know that these hooks exist, how can I break the ones that aren't serving me? Right? How can I break certain habits in my life uh, that, that aren't helping me live better? And so I've done exactly that in many aspects of my life to, uh, to, to break the hooks of products that I, I don't want to overuse. Interesting. That's pretty cool stuff, actually. We had a, a really good question from Stan, uh, which is, have you studied the difference of habit formation between men, men and women? Uh, to pay more attention to a specific uh, promotion in this formula, I mean, is there a difference between men and women in how they adopt new habits? So uh, that's that's out of my area of expertise, um, but and I I've never I've never liked to classify people. I I, I don't know. It's just something I, I don't know much about uh, the differences between people, and I frankly haven't found it very productive to to classify so broadly based on you know personality types or gender types or racial groups. I, I just haven't found it that useful. Instead, what I find more productive is to closely understand your user and classify them based on their behaviors. Not necessarily by sex, but based on their behaviors. And so what I talk about in the book is to look for what current habits these people have. And this is observable, right? So we don't ask people, hey, do you want to use my new app? It's super awesome, right? Because of course, what are they going to tell you? Yes, sounds great. But instead, I would ask people, how are you currently solving this problem, right? I would look at what current behaviors they have so that we can replace those habits and bring them online, bring them to a technology that's, that uh, is more rewarding uh, or, or solves that problem faster, something that makes some kind of solution that's better than their current solution. But there always has to be a current habit, a current solution. Maybe it's pencil and paper. Maybe it's, you know, they're using three other technologies to do what your one technology could do. But instead of classifying based on any preconceived group, I'd, I'd be more likely to, to, to go and observe how people are solving these problems today. Good. There's a question from Daniel, which is, are habits better formed with sadness or happiness? So that's, that's an interesting question. I think it's actually both sides of the same coin. That uh, when I ask people, most people when, when I ask them, okay, what's, what's Facebook for? And if you think about you know, the Facebook mission statement and, and what's on their, their homepage around connecting the world, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, making, is making the world a more open and connected place or something along those lines, that's kind of the positive version, right? Because Facebook isn't going to tell you, uh, you know, use us when you're lonely. <laughs> but, that, but that's actually the same side of, the sa of one coin. Uh, the reason I like to talk about it in the negative terms, even though, you know, you, you, you could put it in the positive terms. The reason I like to put it in the negative is because then it helps us focus on the pain point, right? Then it helps us understand where in the user's life are they most likely to feel this pain point so that we can solve it, so that we can fix that, that user's pain? Because if the user is without pain, there's no problem. There's no, there's no need for a solution unless there's pain. And so it helps us create what I, you know, what's called a narrative that we can say, okay, the user is in this situation, they're in this routine, and at this point in time and place, that's when they're most likely to feel this, this internal trigger, which so often tends to be a negative emotion. Interesting. Uh, so then we had a question from Joseph, which are what kind of techniques or tools can we be used or can be used to research these triggers and cues? So what tools are you using to actually identify the triggers or cues? Yeah, so um, I go through this process. It, it depends what phase you're, you're in, frankly. If your product is already up and running, uh, then I go through, I, I detail in the book this process called habit testing. 
which uh, I actually didn't make up. I, I gleaned it. I, I named the terms for it, but I gleaned the process from, from a bunch of interviews I did at, at companies like Twitter, uh, where I found that the process uh, of habit testing involves these three phases of identify, codify, and modify. So if you're, and this again applies to products that are already up and running. So uh, the first step is to identify which of your users are using the product habitually, meaning how often would you expect a user to use your product to, to, to create this habit? Identify those people. And then the next step is to codify the path that they took in using your product. So what are the first few things that they did when they began to use their product? What's unique about those users that uh, signifies them as habitual users, right? Did they on Twitter it was following? If you were a person who followed, I think the number was 30 people, you were very likely to be a habituated customer. You were very likely to be someone who used the product regularly. And then of course the next step is to modify. Is to modify the path so that everybody takes the same path that those habituated users took. Right, so in the case of Twitter, now if you sign up for Twitter, guess what you're going to have to do? If you form a new account, there is no way you're not going to follow somebody. Right, everybody has to follow somebody. So you're going to see the top followed people on Twitter when you first sign up. You're going to see Oprah, you're going to see Martha Stewart, you're going to see Justin Bieber, because they know that when you follow somebody, you're going to become much more likely to use the product in the future. But that's something they gleaned by understanding their most habituated users early on through this process of identify, codify, and modify. And I will add to that, by using KISS metrics, you are able to identify some of those things. Through your web, web app or even a mobile app, by using good analytics, you can really start to be able to identify the paths that these users are taking and be able to really dig in and see all the different information. Now, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I do know that we have a lot of questions that have yet to be asked. If we were unfortunately not able to get to your question, please do reach out to us on Twitter. Ask on Twitter with the hashtag KissWebinar, and we'll be able to continue answering your questions on Twitter. But I do have one last question that I do want to ask, and then we're going to end this webinar. Uh, but Nir, one question that came to me was, in the beginning of this, we went over a lot of big companies. and. Mm -hmm. Do we think that they designed their tools to be habitual, or do we think some of it was just a matter of luck? Yeah, so I guarantee you that the companies I've, uh, I've mentioned have not consciously used the hook model because it didn't exist, <laughs> right? The hook model is, uh, is, is very new. Uh, but what I've done is to figure out you know, where we see habit-forming products, what's a common element that we see time and time again, and I haven't been able to find habit-forming technologies that don't use these four steps. Now, um, you know, we've noticed that over the past decade or so, starting companies is becoming more of a science. It used to be you know, a, a, an art and maybe a, a roulette wheel, <laughs> right? That uh, investors and startups would kind of willy-nilly, you know, put money into a startup. Uh, the, the, the engineers would go into some room, they'd come out a year later, and here's the product, and sometimes it would work, and sometimes it didn't. And of course, we've moved away from that. Right now, we have the lean startup methodology. We have customer development. We have this rapid iteration around how we create products, and it's become a more scientific process by using, as Eric Ries espouses, build, measure, learn methodologies. Right? It's becoming more of a scientific process. Now, very few of the companies that are successful today could tell you at this point in time they used lean to get successful. But it's become part of the scientific method to find the answer faster. And so that's where the hook model fits in, is the hook model is all about in that build phase of build, measure, learn. That's the expensive part. Building is where all the blood, sweat, and tears go, right? If you have the right analytic system like this metrics, measuring and learning is fun and easy. But building the right stuff is where the blood, sweat, and tears all go. So where the hook model fits in is to help you identify which hypotheses you should build first. Right? It used to be we would listen to the hippo, the highest paid officer in the room. Right, That's the hippo, the highest paid officer. And that's how we used to build software. Whatever that person wants, that's what we build. But now we're more enlightened. Right Now we go through customer development and we ask people what we should build. But I think there's actually another evolution of digging a little deeper into user psychology to understand the things that d decide users' behavior that they may not be able to articulate. It's the kind of things you can't listen to in a focus group because people don't know what they don't know. And yet, these techniques predict users' behavior with a high degree of accuracy because they've been proven time and time again through decades and decades of psychology research. So my mission here, my, my quest is to help entrepreneurs build the right thing sooner 
by looking at these principles of consumer psychology. Now, you still have to go through build, measure, learn, right? This isn't a, a magic bullet that you're going to get the right answer right away. We still have to iterate. We still have to test. We still have to try new things. And we're going to be wrong very often. But if we can decrease the amount of times we're wrong, we can save all that money and time and heartache and build the right thing sooner. That was a great answer. Well, nice. thank you very much, Nir. We appreciate you doing this for us and sharing with the entire community about how to create a habit-forming product. For all the folks that we weren't able to get to your questions, once again, I mean, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. You can use the hashtag KISSWebinar. If we aren't able to get to your question on there because of the shortness of the response, please feel free to either reach out to Nir or myself. You can reach out to me at Dan at KISSmetrics. I welcome everybody to go to KISSmetrics.com and sign up for a free trial and start learning more about your users so you can identify how to turn your best users into habit-forming users. And if you have any questions, just let us know. But thanks again, and we'll talk to you all soon.